Well, good evening. So I'm the last on the docket, so I better cut it short, right? What a great night. And tell you, one of the greatest things is getting a room full of men singing to Jesus out loud. Way to go, guys. It sounds beautiful. I'm going to be speaking to you out of uh, the New Testament book of Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6. I trust you brought a Bible or you have one on your device. I want to talk to you about being a man of God. There's a lot of titles that you can have as a man. People will call you Sir, Mr., Doctor. If you live in England, they might call you Lord or Esquire. If you're in the military, Colonel, General, Admiral. Then there's a lot of descriptions that you can have as a man. You could be called a man of science. You can be called a man of accomplishments, a man about town. You can have a a grandson or a son who thinks you're Superman. But the greatest title you could ever bear is the title Man of God. Just to be a man of God, to be God's man. And this conference is called Awaken. And I'm praying that we'll get awakened to the need in our culture of being a man of God. It's a title that Paul the Apostle gives to Timothy in this chapter and these verses, 1 Timothy chapter 6, when he says, but you, O man of God. Now I did a little digging and discovered that title, man of God, shows up 78 times in the Bible. 78 different times, and there are 13 different men who are called man of God. Moses was called a man of God, Joshua, David, Samuel, Elijah, and Elisha were all called man of God, but there's only one person in the New Testament given this singular title, and that is Timothy. A young man that Paul the Apostle led to Christ, discipled, and put into the ministry. He calls him here a man of God. Now, by using that title, what Paul is doing is places him in the lineup of biblical heroes. And that's important. A man of God is a hero. A man of God will be a hero to his wife. A man of God will be a hero to his son and daughter and grandchildren. A man of God will be a hero to his church. A man of God will be a hero to his community. I have a 13-year-old grandson, and on his birthday, we sort of had this camp out, you know, the sort of manly, have to go through all these tests and be declared, you know, you're finally going into manhood. And we were all gathered around the campfire, and We gave him a pep talk, and he was to stand up and shout out at the top of his lungs what he wants to aspire to be. And he stood up with the bonfire going, and these men around his life and friends put his hands in the air, and he said, I want to be a man of God. I want to be a man of God. Well, being God's man is simply letting God control your life, rule over you. Not be a part of your life. Not, well, I do this and I am this, and then I have a side of me that's spiritual, that's religious, but to be a man controlled by God. And this room is a testimony that there are still men in the world who want exactly that. You want the will of God. You want to live for the glory of God. It's not easy in this culture. It's not easy because men, in particular, are being attacked. And that's why your wife needs you, your kids need you, your church needs you, and your community needs you, because we are always being attacked by this world. I heard about three men who were in the waiting room at a hospital. All three of them, their wives were giving birth. They were all excited. And the nurse walked in and said to one of the men, hey, congratulations, your wife just had twins. 
And he stood up and smiled, and he said, well, isn't that a coincidence because I happen to play for the Minnesota Twins? And so he sat down. A few minutes later, the nurse came back in and said to the second man, congratulations, but you just had triplets. He said, no kidding, triplets, really? Isn't that a coincidence because I happen to work for the 3M company? Well, the third man heard all this, fell on the ground, and started moaning. And she said, what's wrong? He said, I happen to work for the 7-Up company. <laughs> Listen, life isn't easy. There's challenges that come our way. Paul had his challenges. Timothy had his challenges. But let me give you a few keys to being a man of God. And let's look at our text, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, a few simple verses to close the evening with, but you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God, who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless, until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing. The first step that we must take in being God's man, a man of God, is to forsake evil. To forsake evil. In verse 11, he starts out, but you, O man of God. So what he has been telling Timothy up to this point is about false men, false teachers, ungodly men, worldly men. And now he pivots and he says, but, in contrast to them, but, you, O oh man of God, flee these things. The first step in being a man of God is learning to say no so that we can say yes. There's a lot of things we need to say no to so that we can say yes to something else. Psalm 1 begins, blessed is the man who walks not, notice the negative, in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the way of sinners, nor does he sit in the seat of the scornful. All of that is negative. There's a lot of power in negative thinking. Ask any athlete. They learn negative thinking. They say no to ice cream and Snickers and late night parties and bags full of Doritos so they can say yes to training and discipline because they want to win. So, we say no, we forsake evil. Today, men are in trouble. Every kind of assault possible from the media is coming our way and targeting the men of this generation. I was reading an article recently, things that we know about, but I was reading this article that said there are five areas where Satan is constantly attacking men and bringing them down. Money, Sex, pride, envy, lust. Those five areas. The article explained pride, or excuse me, money, is the lie that says, if I get a lot of money, I will be a satisfied person. That's a lie. Sex. Not just the lie of having lots of it, but the lie that says, you can look and you can flirt as long as you don't indulge. No, stay away from it. That's a lie. Then there's pride. And the lie with pride is that I can't admit to other people that I'm struggling because they'll think I'm less of a person and they'll look down on me. Then there's envy. Looking at what other people have in life and saying they don't deserve that. I deserve that. And then finally, lust, being consumed with the desire to take 
more than what God has given you. All those five areas we are being assaulted in. So we need to learn to say no so that we can say yes, but you, O man of God, flee these things. And when we look in the Bible, we see there's some heroes of the faith that learn to say no. They learn to flee temptation. Joseph was one of them. We know the story about Potiphar's wife coming on to him, grabbing him, and he ran out of the house naked. He streaked out of the house, went in the other direction. We know the story about Daniel. He learned to say no so that he could say yes. He purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies. And the rest of Daniel's life, the effectiveness of the rest of his life, depended upon the decision that he made at that moment. And I just want to say, this is a perfect night for it, all of life is filled with moments like that, crisis moments, moments of choice, of decision. Where you and I are today is the result of the choice and the turn in the road we took yesterday. We are a product of our choices. So there are certain things that defile us, just like Daniel knew, I can't have this food because it will defile me as a kosher Jewish young man. There are certain things in our lives that defile us, books, movies, relationships, acquaintances, places that we should not be a part of. It's learning to say no that we can say yes. Back in 1969, I was a little kid, and I remember when we landed on the moon. And what a big moment that was to watch the moon landing. But what I remember is, because my dad brought the newspaper home the next day, on the front headline of the newspaper says, we've conquered outer space. What a headline, we've conquered outer space. You know what we need to conquer, men? Inner space. That's the final frontier, conquering inner space. When you conquer inner space, that's your character that Daryl was talking about. You're building character. You know, your reputation is, is what you are on the outside. Your character is who you are when nobody's looking. And that's inner space that needs to be conquered. The Bible says that the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all of his goings. I love the story in the Bible about Moses. And what I love is what he learned about God always seeing things. It says that one day he was looking in this direction and looking in that direction. This is early on when God was calling him. He looked in one direction, looked in the other direction. He didn't see anybody looking at him, so he killed an Egyptian. That was Moses' problem. He looked this way and that way, but he didn't look that way. God was looking. God sees it all. So the first step to being a man of God is forsaking evil. Second step, following that which is good. He goes on to say, but you, O man of faith, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Being a man of God isn't just turning from something, it's turning to something, to someone. By the way, that's the best illustration I know of, of repentance, turning from, but then turning to. A lot of people live just in the negatives. I don't do this anymore. I don't do that anymore. Great. What is it you do, actually? Where, what direction have you turned in? It was Charles Haddon Spurgeon who said, conversion is turning on to the right road, but then, then you have to walk it. You walk that road. You turn from that you might turn to. Some people have enough religion to make them decent, just not enough religion to make them dynamic. So we flee and we turn to. We follow after the good. And there's there's six things, I'm not going to go into depth, but there's six things he mentions to young Timothy to be a man of God, to follow after. He says, pursue righteousness. That just means right living, right actions. Pursue godliness. That's a right attitude. 
Pursue faith. That's having the right object, and that's God. Love, that's having the right motive. Patience, that's having the right outlook. And finally, gentleness, that's having the right temperament. So run away from that which is bad, but run toward that which is good. You know, I love the fact that there's a couple of great baseball players and many baseball fans in the audience tonight. There was another baseball player who became an evangelist many years ago named Billy Sunday. He was a professional baseball player, and God called him into the ministry. And early on, when he was a young man, an older Christian came up to Billy Sunday when he was just sort of getting his baseball legs going, and he said, Billy, there's three things you must do in your life, and if you do them, nobody can ever call you a backslider. He said, take 15 minutes a day and let God speak to you. That's Bible study. Take another 15 minutes a day and talk to God. That's prayer. And then he said, finally, spend 15 minutes a day telling other people about God. That's witnessing. He said, if you do those three things, you will never backslide. That's pursuing God. That's following after God. So forsaking evil, following good. The third step, fighting battles. Fighting battles. And men, I'm calling you to arms tonight. Fighting the right battles. In verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Did you know that men are wired to be warriors? God wired us to be fighters. That's why when we were little boys, we, we played army and we got interested in guns and things like that. We wrestled. God hardwired us to be warriors. In Genesis chapter 2, the Bible says that God put man in the garden to tend it and to keep it, and the word means to protect it. We're protectors. Even, even the secular world, even evolutionists have to admit this. They say men have a built-in aggression. They're hunters and gatherers. They need to protect their offspring. They need to guard and defend their community. This is from a secular evolutionist. Here, Paul says, fight the good fight of faith. That's just code in the Bible for the whole body of truth. Fight for that. In the little book of Jude, in verse 3, Jude says, contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered. The word contend means put up a good fight for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Now, some, some people hear that and say, well, actually, Christians shouldn't fight. No, we should be pacifists. See, contention in some circles is seen as a flaw or a sin. And I think our society has, for years, pictured Jesus sort of as, well, I'm gentle and lowly, and so they think, well, he's always gentle and lowly. He never raised his voice. He never called people out. He never embarrassed anyone. He just sort of stood there smiling at petting little children and healing birds. And the paintings of Jesus throughout the years, they have pictured him in so many cases as being weak and effeminate and wistful. But you know, if you know your New Testament, you know there was a side of Jesus that could be contentious. In the, in the right circumstance, he could put up a good fight for the faith. He could walk into the temple and overturn tables and drive people out with a, a whip and say to the leaders, you brood of vipers. Hello. Whitewashed tombs, you are of your father the devil. Now, I, I agree, Christians shouldn't pick fights, but, but Christians should engage in the battle. We should engage in the battle. And here's what I mean. 60% of people in their 20s and 30s who grow up in church are leaving church. They're leaving church. We're losing, especially young men. 
when Christian men don't pass on vision to younger men, they're going to look for it somewhere else. That's what we have to fight for, and it's worth fighting for. Listen, it's time for Christian men to come out of the closet, to be seen and to be heard, to stop being spiritual wallflowers, shrinking back. We need to be bold in our generation. You know, I notice everybody else is okay with being bold. People in the LGBTQ community are pretty bold. People in the transgender community are pretty bold. Black Lives Matter folks are pretty bold. The pronoun police is pretty bold. It's time for us Christians to be bold and unashamed and unafraid that we love Jesus Christ and he's the only hope for this world. Amen. Fight for the faith. So three steps in following and being men of God, forsaking evil, following good, fighting battles. Fourth and finally, faithful endurance. Just keep doing those things. Just keep repeating. Rinse, repeat. Rinse, repeat. Keep doing that. Enduring. He closes off this paragraph, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Jesus Christ who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless, until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing. Simply put, stay faithful. Stay at it. Men of God are men of God only if they're men of God's word, men of God's truth, ruled by God's authority. Keep, he says, keep this commandment. Listen, it doesn't take a great man to do mighty things. It just takes a faithful man. It takes a man who says, here I am, Lord. Send me. I'm nothing special, but I'll do it. I'll go. I'll speak. I'll go to the school board, I'll stand in the gap, I'll, I'll speak to that person, I'll, I'll do this for my family. It doesn't take a great man, it just takes a faithful man. Somebody who says, I'll do it. Stay with it, S stay at it. Don't shrink back. Did you know that when Christopher Columbus had this crazy idea of going after a new world, sailing out for a new world, people said, you're crazy, you're nuts, don't do it, it's too dangerous. But he wouldn't listen. When Henry Ford had the idea of a motor car, people said he was crazy. In fact, his good friend Thomas Edison said, that's a stupid idea. In fact, Henry, you should just give that up and come and work for me. I'll give you a good job. Ford wouldn't listen. He stayed with it. When the Wright brothers had this insane idea of man can fly, his father, his friends, the local press, all told him, leave flying to the birds, stop it. But he, they didn't listen. And they, all of those stories, they shared one ingredient, and that is endurance, endurance, endurance. And then... Endurance is sometimes the best testimony. You just keep showing up. You just keep doing the thing. You just keep being faithful to your church and what God has called you to do. So better than Mr., Sir, Captain, General, Doctor, better than man of science or even man of steel is to aspire to be a man of God. Amen. First step to being a man of God is to simply be God's man, or your life is given over to the Lord Jesus Christ. And some of you men haven't taken that step yet, and Pastor Jack's going to close in just a minute and give those of you who have not had that opportunity, that opportunity. And you know what? This is what you need to know. He won't force himself on you. The Bible says he stands at the door and he knocks. He's a gentleman. He wants to come in and change your life. 
but he only operates by personal consent. When it comes to salvation, God is pro-choice. When it comes to abortion, God is pro-life. But God, when it comes to your salvation, he will not impose himself on you, but he's letting you make the choice. And it's the most important choice you could ever make. And, and the most important title you could ever bear is to be man of God. So, Father, I pray for these men, and I thank you for so many faithful men, not only at Prestonwood Church, but people in the area and throughout the state who have come together for this conference. Lord, you've inspired us. You've invigorated us. You've encouraged us. You've challenged us. And now we pray in this moment, as the invitation is given, that men who haven't said yes to Jesus personally would do so for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.